Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video is going to be on the top toxins that slow down your mitochondrial function. We'll break down what those toxins are as well as mitochondria. We'll give you a crash course in that as well. Again, if you guys enjoy the content, please smash that like button. Again, put your comments down below regarding the topic. Let me know. I'm really curious to know what y'all have to think. All right, so let's dive in. So Toxins, right? These could be environmental toxins. You're going to see things like mold, which could be in your home from water damage. You're going to see toxins like heavy metals, which can significantly impair the electron transport chain and generating ATP. Um, you can see other things like pesticides that are going to impact your hormones and make you overly estrogenic and make you fat storing and more inflammatory. So these are all different toxins in the environment, and we'll kind of break those down. So first off, we have our mitochondria. That's like the powerhouse of the cell. This is how your body generates ATP, right? There's a couple of ways we do this, right? So we typically have glycolysis where our body churns some, um, basically goes through glycolysis and, and converts some ATP out of glycolysis. This is just breaking down glucose, you know, typically like one to three ATP on there. And then you're going to see the Krebs cycle where your body basically creates NADH and FADH2. It's just gathering hydrogens, right? So it pumps around there two times. And again, these are just rough estimates. You're looking at five to six ATP as it rounds that twice. And then those extra hydrogens, right? Think of these as reduction, reducing compounds. Reduction means a gain in electrons. So when you have more hydrogen, when you go from NAD to NADH, you have a gain of an electron. There's a reduction there, even though it's kind of opposite because you're thinking reducing, but there's more hydrogen. So it's kind of opposite. Reduction is a gain in the electron. Hydrogen is an electron. So you, you're going to go NADH, and then you're going to do the FADH2. These are reducing compounds. They then funnel into the electron transport chain where you generate another, I want to say 30, 31, 32, 33 ATP. All in, you're looking at like 36 to 39 ATP, kind of factoring glycolysis, factoring in the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, same thing, and that funnels over to the electron transport chain. So really important. A lot of nutrients that are needed for those pathways, B vitamins, magnesium, amino acids. And if we dump things like mercury or heavy metals in there, it's going to gunk up the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle. Also, if we put in mold toxins, mycotoxins, they're going to also stress the energy production pathways. It's like having this big, beautiful engine and you throw a wrench in it, right? It's just not going to run properly. We need good stress management because if we're overly catabolic, overly in a stressed out state producing too much cortisol, that cortisol is going to cause it to be catabolic. We're going to break down B vitamins. We're going to break down amino acids. We're going to break down the nutrients that were actually needed to run those pathways. So it's very important. We want to be anabolic, not catabolic. Anabolic's building up, healing, recovering. Catabolic means uh, breaking down at a faster rate then you can recover and heal. So of course, we kind of went over the big ones, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle slash citric acid cycle, and then the electron transport chain. We talked about the ATP. ATP gets broken down to ADP. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and that they pull off a phosphate there, it makes it ADP, adenosine diphosphate two. So we go from three to two, and that phosphate is gonna create energy, instantaneous energy. And so we talked about the different ways these toxins can impair it. So of course, mold toxins, you're going to get these from water damage in your home or living in a previous in home that previously had it. Again, it depends, right? Because if I have patients that are still in a moldy environment, it makes it a little bit harder to deal with it because the constant exposure is there. If they've left that environment and we know, okay, that the home they're in now is not moldy, then we can have different approaches to try to address that. And so we always want to look at, is there an active moldy environment? The next thing is we want to look at, are we eating organic? Because if we're eating a bunch of estrogenic foods or we're eating neurological toxins, because pesticides kill bugs, pretty much two ways. They affect their reproductive capacity, so it's an effect their hormones, or it affects their neurological capacity. And again, when you combine different pesticides and you cook them and all this stuff, there's a whole bunch of reactivity that we don't even know because you know, usually heat tends to speed up reactions and can, can make things more problematic. And so pesticides are a big one, especially the organic chlorine pesticides or even things like Roundup or glyphosate. These are other types of pesticides as well. And then I would say uh, after that, like I already mentioned, mold toxins, I already mentioned pesticides, and the other one's going to be your heavy metals. 
So heavy metals are going to play a major role in that. Mercury and lead are going to be the big two. We could also throw arsenic and cadmium in there, but you know, mercury and lead are, are significant. And so with mercury and lead, they're also synergistic. So you could do, you can do like the lethal number. So the lethal number is you, you line up a hundred rats and you feed the rats a little bit of mercury and you say, okay, when the first rat dies, that's kind of your lethal dose, right? That's what kills 1% of the rats this dose. Then you do the same thing for lead. You take a hundred new rats, you parse it out the lead, you dose it up. Okay. One rat dies. Okay. That's your lethal dose for lead. Now you get a hundred new rats, no exposure to these chemicals, and you feed them 1% of the mercury that killed, 1% of the lead that killed. Guess how many rats actually survived that? Actually, they all die because the synergistic effects of these metals. And so it's good to look at the metals and we'll run like a urinary heavy metal test. We'll look at DMPS. We'll look at various toxins that could impair or they could, um, we'll look at DMPS, which will actually be a urinary test. So we'll collect your, your, we'll have you wake up, take your first morning pee, take the DMPS, and then we'll collect your urine for three hours. That's a chelation compound that has a strong affinity to metals. I mean, the patients will say, well, doesn't that increase your heavy metals? Well, no, it's only a chelator. It's like taking a magnet where there's iron filings and dragging that magnet across the iron filings, it's going to grab those iron filings. And the goal is that it's going to go out the kidneys and you'll get a really good accurate measurement of your tissue burden of heavy metals. Cause you can just do that test. And I've done it with patients before where you do a pre urine test, no DMPS or no chelation compound. They do the post and you do the, the chelation compound. You'll see a significant increase in heavy metals, a significant increase. So something definitely, um, you know, it's going to increase the body's ability to detoxify and it gives you a much better accurate measurement of your tissue burden. Cause you can look at heavy metals via the blood. Again, unless you're a kid and you're chewing the lead paint in the wall, or you just got exposed to a broken thermometer that had mercury in it, you're not going to get an accurate representation of your body burden of metals. So you need to do a tissue test. Now, some will say do the hair. Well, the problem is there's studies that if you don't have good detoxification, you may not even be able to push the metals into the hair because part of how the body detoxifies, it will push metals into the hair. So if your hair levels are low in mercury or lead, it may not be an indication that they're low. It just may be that you don't have good detoxification capacity to even push them into the hair. And then we go into urinary mycotoxins. So again, we may want to look at urinary mycotoxins. It depends. If someone's in an active home um, that has mold in it, active exposure, we may want to just ask a couple questions. Hey, do you feel better when you're out of the home? Does that brain fog or those weird neurological issues or that energy, does it get significantly better? And do you feel worse again when you're back in? So if it's like flipping a switch, that's a really good sign. That there's significant amounts of mold in the home and we want to be aware of that. Got to fix that. Got to rectify it, right? Is it an active leak? Is it just high levels of humidity in the house? And it's just kind of more systemic because you need a good dehumidifier. Do you have a basement that needs to be waterproofed and and fogged and addressed. These are all good options. So we'll put some links down below for some of the fogging solution that I use, as well as the different mercury, uh, the mercury test, heavy metal test, as well as the mold test as well. I also do a urinary mycotoxin test. This can be helpful if we know there's either active or previous exposure. Again, if there's active exposure, I always kind of trump and, and put the home as a priority first. And then second would be the actual mycotoxin test in the urine. It's good to know if it's an active issue when you're living in it, or is it a secondary issue, but you have previous exposure and then we can, we can look at that. And I, I always challenge those tests. I always do things like n acetylcysteine and glutathione because I want to see how your body's ability is to eliminate these mycotoxins in the urine. Because if your detoxification pathways are, are low or poor, you have poor glutathione levels and you may not be able to push out those mycotoxins in the urines. I always like to make sure those pathways are a little bit more primed and ready to go so we can get an accurate measurement of those mycotoxins in the urine. So much better to do that as well. Um, outside of that, so if you want to dive in deeper and you want to reach out to someone like myself where we can kind of look at, we can actually test the mitochondrial function. We can run organic acid tests that will look at the different nutrients or the different Krebs cycle inter intermediary nutrients like citrate, isocitrate, fumarate, malate, succinate. These are really important metabolic compounds that are involved in the Krebs cycle. We can look at glycolysis and pyruvate and lactate, which are helpful for looking at B vitamins and CoQ10 as well. We can also look at things like um, carnitine and fatty acid oxidation, which are your body's 
ability to generate ATP from fat, beta fatty acid oxidation. So that's very helpful to look at that as well. So we can run tests to look at mitochondrial function. We can look at the heavy metals. We can look at the various toxicity. Um, we can even look at pesticides too. We can run industrial toxin tests that will look at some of those compounds, whether it's plastics, whether it's gasoline byproducts, or whether it is pesticides or mold. So we can look at all three of those as well. So again, if you guys enjoyed today's video and you want to dive in deeper, I'll put a link down below where you can reach out and see some of the recommended products and tests that I specifically use in my practice. And if you want to reach out virtually, we can dive in and see what our next steps are to work on getting you better and seeing what kind of stressors may be present in your specific situation. Again, if you guys enjoyed it, feel free, comments down below. Uh, you'll see the link there and feel free to enjoy and, and share with family and friends. All right, take care, y'all. Bye now.